The newspapers will be full of it. Let's flick through the headline with CNBC's head of programming, Chris Bishop. Zimbabweans will go to the polls on July the 30th. That's the business day. Mnangagwa has officially applied for Zimbabwe to rejoin the Commonwealth that it left in 2003 under Mugabe, the newspaper says, and has invited the grouping of former British colonies to send observers to its elections. The Commonwealth suspended Zimbabwe over accusations of having flawed elections in 2002, and it's clear President Emerson Mnangagwa wants a clean election this time to reinforce his claim as president. President proclaims poll dates in the Newsday in Harare. Apparently, Mnangagwa has set aside September the 8th as the date for the presidential runoff if there's no outright winner in the first round of polls. The state-owned Herald in Harare says that of the 5.4 million registered voters, more than 4.7 million use different platforms to inspect the voters' role. And we shouldn't really worry about the outcome at all also, according to the Herald. It's 70% for ED, according to a survey by African scholars based in Kenya. If Zimbabwe holds harmonised elections today, ZANU-PF presidential candidate Comrade Emerson Monagagwa will garner 70% of the vote against NDC alliance leader Mr Nelson Chamisa's 24%. An opinion poll by the Pan-African Forum Limited has revealed. Let's wait for what could be an exciting build-up to the Zimbabwe elections on July the 30th. And now to the millionaire preacher who saved President Mnangagwa's neck so he could fight the selections. Justice Maposa. But first up, who is he? Your, 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 your suffering is very important. Poverty is very important. Poverty uh, uh, prepares you for the unknown, prepares you for the future, launches you for the future. So when you're poor, you see things other people don't see. This is why at the age of 13, I was already carrying a camera and in business. It would be a, 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 not really a prophecy, but it would be probably the, a, a foretelling what would happen in the future, per se. It's good to have that kind of spirit, but we all know starting a business from mm. scratch mm. is very, very difficult. Yes. How did you maneuver some of the obstacles? What were the obstacles? There were many obstacles. Firstly, young, inexperienced, mm -hmm. with passion mm -hmm. and vigor <laughs> and motivation. Mm -hmm. Motivated by money, motivated by poverty, the fact that you are poor, you want to get out. So you want to jump and leapfrog that. So there's that passion and that um, aggression towards that. Mm -hmm. But then the pitfalls were inexperience, uh, you are unbankable, you don't have collateral, and no one can sign collateral for you. So many business opportunities miss you. Mm -hmm. And no bank can loan, lend you any money. No bank has ever so lent you money. How did you navigate money? Because everyone talks about the difficulty in the immediacy of funding, especially when a good idea is upon <coughs> time. How did you navigate the money? Who did you get as an investor? Who believed in you? Um, we, we had in those days um, opportunities which we used a lot. I used a lot of those opportunities. From the days of my camera uh, men um, um, days to um, my, my merchandising, working for Software Connection, Incredible Connection, mm -hmm. those were the breeding grounds of what would now become a lot of modern day business people. I know a lot of them that, were, that came from Software Connection and Incredible Connection who are running multi-enterprises. Mm -hmm. But you are who you are now. Yeah. You are Justice Maposa. Yes. You have a diverse business portfolio. Yes. You have interests in a lot of things. Yes. People look at you to see where they should put their money. So where are you putting your money? Currently, we're putting our money in Zimbabwe. Uh, we, we're really um, banking on Zimbabwe uh, for the fortunes of the business, uh, for the longevity of the business. Zimbabwe gives us what other, no other country currently gives us. Mm -hmm. Zimbabwe is virgin land. Anything you think of, anything you want to do, you can do it in Zimbabwe. But you are sentimental about Zimbabwe, and sentimental <laughs> for the right reasons. You were born there, of course. <laughs> but you've made most of your money here. Yes. Why is Zimbabwe a better opportunity in terms of revenue for you and your business outlook over the next five years? Why, why do you think it would be more stable? It offers, Zimbabwe offers low-hanging fruits 
-hmm. which are not there in South Africa. All of those mm -hmm. long-hanging fruits in South Africa have been picked up. <laughs> there, there isn't any. Mm -hmm. South Africa offers you a, a place to plant a, a, an, a, an orange tree, which will then ripe in seven, eight years, ten years later. Mm -hmm. Whereas Zimbabwe, there are those oranges that are ripe. You just need to pluck them out, wash them out, package them, ship them overseas, and there you are, you've made your money. I'll give you this a number. The, 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 the mineral wealth of Zimbabwe is amazing mm -hmm. and untapped, actually, for a lack of a better word. But a lot of people will say about Zimbabwe that it has great opportunity yes. and great potential, as you said. Yes. But the infrastructure is not what it used to be. Zimbabwe's yes. infrastructure has been left derelict. And it gives way, surely doing business in a country that still has to invest in infrastructure is more cumbersome than anything else. You would pay a prime. Mm -hmm. For every profit, you pay a prime. Mm -hmm. That's the prime we are willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And if we participate in that, then the premium of us launching or setting up or selling any business in the future becomes higher. Mm. I mean, the Zimbabwe, you, you, the entry into Zimbabwe is much harder but easier. Um, if you never get through the challenges of uh, the infrastructure, uh, dilapidation, for lack of a better word, you end up somewhere. Uh, Zimbabwe needs to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. If you participate in the rebuilding of Zimbabwe, 10 years later, you are selling your business to people that want to expand from the UK, from South Africa, mm -hmm. and they are looking for a business in Zimbabwe that is similar to yours. In the second half, how this great escape unfolded. Uh, when I got that call, I asked him, where are you? And then he said, I'm here. I asked him, where do you want to go? He told me. I then said, where was he? He was in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And he told you he wanted to go? He wanted to go anywhere where he would be safe. Where did he end up going? He ended up coming here because, um, or you mean where did he end up going by then? Mm -hmm. Well, he, he and his team that was there saw that it was okay for him to cross into Beira, and then I'll pick him up in Beira, which is exactly what happened. I picked him up in Beira, brought him here. Do, we stay to, I don't even say looked after him because how do you look after? Don't look after your father. You stay with your father. But you're acting so humble. You provided a jet to go save the incumbent who is now the president of Zimbabwe. That is surely a big thing. It is, that could prove to be a turning point in the history of Zimbabwe. Yes, it was important, especially for us Zimbabweans. When I got that call, the first question I asked myself was, if you don't do it, or who must do it? Stay tuned when we return the inside story of an African president's night flight to freedom. Welcome back to Political Capital, the intersection of money and politics. The man who saved the president, Emerson Mnangagwa's life, has a story of his own. A controversial businessman who has allegations of corruption around him. In this part of the story, I start by asking him how he saved President Mnangagwa's neck that fateful night. We start talking because we used to talk. When we was meet. he a nervous man there? Was he worried for his life? No, no, he's a, no, there's one thing that you need to know. He's never a nervous man. Never in any condition, and I've, I've seen him through this period. He's never nervous. I think it's because of, he went into war when he was 14, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, 14, 15 years old. He grew up in war. He left the country to go and learn in a guerrilla warfare mm. and stay as a guerrilla at 14, 15. Surely he's seen a lot of things. He pre stays prepared mm -hmm. for whatever would come his way. Uh, when I got that call, I asked him, where are you? And then he said, I'm here. I asked him, where do you want to go? He told me. I then said, where was he? He was in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And he told you he wanted to go? He wanted to go anywhere where he would be safe. Where did he end up going? He ended up coming here because, um, or you mean where did he end up going by then? Mm -hmm. Well, he, he and his team that was there saw that it was okay for him to cross into Beira and then I'll pick him up in Vera, which is exactly what happened. I picked him up in Vera, brought him here. 
do we stay to I don't even say looked after him because how do you look after don't look after your father? You stay with your father. But you're acting so humble. You provided a jet to go save the incumbent who is now the president of Zimbabwe. That is surely a big thing. It is that could prove to be a turning point in the history of Zimbabwe. Yes, it was important, especially for us Zimbabweans. When I got that call, the first question I asked myself was, if you don't do it, or who must do it? It's your call now. You must make a decision, yes or no. Would I blame myself if the fortunes of Zimbabwe don't change? Would I blame myself if Zimbabwe erupts into a fire? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. If he had been shot dead, what would have happened? What about his followers? What would have happened? What would that country have been? So these are the questions I ask myself. And I said, now we are here where we are as CEOs. And here is a, a man. I'm going to call him a man because he was a man then. He was not a, a vice president. He was an ordinary, ordinary Just man after on the street. being fired yes, by yes, Robert Mugabe. Yes, and a man I knew. Mm. What do you do? Mm. You offer that kind, kind of friendship. You're planning on going back to Zimbabwe? Yes. You're, in, you're going to start Yes. About nine companies there. That's a huge number. Give me sectors. And what excites you about sectors? We are already in Zimbabwe. We've been in Zimbabwe now for the past two years. Mm -hmm. We've already got staff. We've got salaries that we pay. The only issue with, with us now is we haven't launched. But we've got nine businesses. We are in the Which aviation space. Mm -hmm. We are in the avi aviation space. We are in the energy space. We are in the technology space. We are in the banking sector. We are in the insurance. We are in logistics. We are in transportation. Talk about all the big events that mm -hmm. happen in Zimbabwe. We do the Gwanda Gospel Show. Go and look at it. Go and look at its magnitude. We've just done uh, Miss, uh, 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 Miss Zimbabwe last year. Go and look at what it was. We've just done some of the events that we've done generally. Your carnival, for instance, mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. Where else have you seen three million people on the street? We did that for Zimbabwe. And even your CNN said it's Africa rising. Look at the quality and look at the atmosphere. Look at who was there. Look at how Zimbabwe was in that weekend. Mm. This is the Zimbabwe we as the children of Zimbabwe want. We want a Zimbabwe that does your, 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 your JB, I mean, your, your, your uh, for, um, I don't know what they call themselves now, the horse race in Deben. You call that Deben Jeb July? July. Yeah. yeah. We, want, July. we want the Deben July. Mm -hmm. We want the Jazz Festival that mm -hmm. happens in Cape Town. We want your normal derbies of your Orlando parents and Kesa chiefs. We want the hotels to boom with those events. We want the transportation to boom with those events. This is our aspirations in Zimbabwe. Do people speak about the fact that they're actively having numerous and multiple rallies within a short space of time and that Emerson Nangagwa is hardly campaigning. Surely that should say something. MDC is a party in waiting to win and become a governing party. Mm -hmm. ZANU-PF is a party in government. So the president's time is not the same mm -hmm. as the MDC's time. Mm -hmm. The president's time is governed by a lot of things. He's a country president. He's running the country. Mm -hmm. So his time is limited. He cannot be probably at every rally, rally as he would want. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm sitting in South Africa, but I'm speculating generally mm -hmm. with, with little knowledge that I've got mm -hmm. about the ins and goings. I'm not part of the campaign uh, team of Zimbabwe. I'm not. I'm just saying as a, as a man that surely People know who Zanu PF is. Mm. I know who Zanu PF is. People know the ills and the good of Zanu PF. Mm. The bad and the good of Zanu PF is known. People know the good and the bad of MDC. This is what is called democracy. Mm. I'm saying, and this is what we're saying as the youth democracy at work, open up the elections, free observers, let everyone, you go choose yours, mm. let me go choose mine, let the next one choose his. But you see, Justice is yeah. different when I make. A political choice yeah. than when you make a political choice. Yes. I stand to lose in the immediate and maybe as part of the collective. This could be a business imperative for you if you back the wrong horse, as it were. How important is it that you're backing the voice that will become part of that rebuilding of Zimbabwe? We don't back. Uh, uh, there is no horses to bet. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. This is there. We are not going to play that part in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. In Zimbabwe, we are not there as partisans. Justice, it would be remiss for me not to speak about, about some of the threats that have been voiced against your life, some of the threats you believe yes. are, are real. Why do you believe people want you dead? 
Uh, because uh, I, I speak my mind and I, 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 I do basically what I believe should be done at that point in time. I'm that kind of a person. And secondly, uh, we seem to be threatening a lot of businesses which are established in Zimbabwe um, that don't want to see us coming in. So whom do you believe is after you? Are these <laughs> political people or business people? Or? It's both political and business, yes. Politically, I'm seen to be very close to the president. It's a space that is guarded. Um, many people don't like that. Uh, many people feel, why him? Why not the other one? Why not me? Um, secondly, in business, um, there are those that say he's captured the president, or he does this, or he's very close, or he will take away this, or he will come up with this and shut us down there. That narrative is there. Um, and there are general people that will hate you for being who you are. And thirdly, you know, his enemies become your enemy as well because you are helping him. You help the president. Uh, his enemies become yours overnight. It, it, is a, 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 it goes without a saying. Threats and that general atmosphere of being unsafe and worried for your life is the reason why so many businessmen left Zimbabwe. Yes. And I'm talking about people like Trevor Ngube, for yes. instance, yes. who made this home. Yes. You also called this home. Yes. Strife yes. also left Zimbabwe. Now you and Mnangagwa are asking those same people to come back. Has anything essentially changed? Because people say, it's Mnangagwa's friends and regime that kicked us out. Why do they want us back? <laughs> I don't believe that. I, I believe Zimbabwe has changed. And I say this honestly with conviction. Zimbabwe is not the same, and it will not be the same. Let's allow Zimbabwe and let's allow Zimbabweans with Africa and their partners and their friends and brothers in South Africa, in Botswana, in Swaziland, to go into Zimbabwe and build. I'll give you an example. Uh, we cannot stay outside the country forever. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have to go home. Uh, for me, this has been a home for a very long time. I mean, I grew up here. Mm. But um, there is a point when you say, let's go in and assist our, our country to become something. Justice, you're seen as someone who is a great um, entrepreneur, someone who's proven that yes. they are able to do it. But you're also seen to be close to power. People say things like, you get large tenders because you are close to power. You retort. Uh, I guess people see me for whatever they see me, but I'll, I'll, give, it the way, I'll give it to you as follows. I'm a go-getter. Mm -hmm. I, I never allow that there's a door that's closed. I keep on knocking on it. My, my childhood references will show you that. I keep on knocking on it till, it till it opens. Yes, I am close to a lot of people who are in powerful positions, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make me, that doesn't make my business. Actually, there is less business fortune I've derived from those people in, in the positions of power. Mm. There is uh, allegations made about you in the yes. South African media. Yes. There's um, allegations made about improper business dealings yes. in the Northwest. Were you close to the former premier of the Northwest? How close was that? And why do you not see the problem that others are speaking about when they speak about your contracts in the Northwest? I don't, because uh, I was in operation in the Northwest before Comrade Suprema Omapilo came into power. Mm -hmm. I was already in operation. Mm -hmm. So actually, there is nothing new that I got in the Northwest mm -hmm. in the period of Comrade Suprema Omapilo. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. He found me operating in the Northwest, and I continued operating in the Northwest. And I did not expand, I did not shrink. So you cannot even talk of a new contract which I got in the, in the Northwest yeah. under Suprema Oma Pilos. I'm going to close off this part of our conversation by asking you about the Hawks. Yes. Are you under investigations? Have you been told what you're being investigated for? And what is your defense to that? Yes, there were people, this is true, there were people that complained uh, about things that they saw as irregular to them. 
and they sent the matters to the Hawks. The Hawks sent me questions. That was June last year. Mm. The Hawks sent me questions in June last year, which mm. I re, which I, I responded to in, in, in an affidavit format. Mm. So there is an affidavit that I responded to, mm. which in detail answers to all that. And the Hawks went to go check on those allegations. And mm. that was the last time I ever heard about you the Hawks. You have not heard about I this. I have not the heard. Hawks. There is no Hawks that has come knocking. Mm. And I admit to you, yes, mm. I can show it to you, even to you, in black and white. Mm. It was in June, July, mm. which which is last day, when I spoke to the Hawks, and the Hawks were asking me, well, one, two, three, four, five, and I said to them, go and check, it's there. We've done this day, we've done this day, we've done this day. Go and check if there's any further questions, come back to me. That was the last time I heard about it. But in light of that, I must ask you, mm. is it worth it? Because, you know, when you're a businessman seen next to a politician, people think that you're illegally benefiting from that relationship. So is it worth having these relationships? Should you not just excommunicate every political leader? <laughs> No, no, we are fearless people. We are young. This is our country. This is our Africa. Why should we fear our political leaders? Mm -hmm. We should actually be very close to them. Mm -hmm. We should be the first to say to them, you're offline. We should be the ones to say to them, you're off-tangent. Mm -hmm. We should be the ones saying to them, these are our aspirations. Your, politi your policies are not working for us in business. Change them. This is not working for us. This is not working for us. A lot of things that we pick up in business. Let me end this on this note. Um, we've learned lessons in South Africa uh, from the experiences of the Jacob Zuma administration. But among them, I think we learned about the potential conflict and, and susceptibility of the closeness of business and government. We learned about one notorious family, which could argue that they were once business people, and now they, they would be hard pressed to find their reputation back. How important is reputation to Mr. Maposa? What would you want your legacy to be? And how are you going to jealously defend that reputation that nobody can reproach it? All of us have got a conscience, upbringing, and your convictions. And that is what guides me. My prayer every day, God charts and orders my steps. The Lord is my shepherd. And my conscience would never allow me to do anything untoward. Mm. And you know, because your con conscience starts pricking you first. And if you listen to your conscience, it guides your legacy as to what you become. There are so many things I've been through, and I've survived till today because of that. Thank you very much for being with us on this edition. We are back with more on Tuesday at 6.30 only on CNBC Africa. Till then, good evening.